Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce this conference in my capacity as Provost of Trinity College, but also as a governing board member of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology. Over the next two days, we can look forward to talks and plenary sessions on issues relating to the kicks and to partnership, funding models, synergies, and the regions. And I'm delighted, and we're all delighted, us governing board members uh, and uh, uh, members from the European Commission, that so many key players have assembled in Dublin and in Trinity College for this uh, conference. The EIT, as captured in the title of today's conference, is about fostering innovation and strengthening synergies between higher education, research, and the business sectors in Europe. And this university, Trinity College Dublin, provides an example of some of the ways in which excellent European universities can place innovation at the core of their activities. As you know, we're a long established university. Trinity was founded more than 420 years ago. But this is the newest building in the university, the one you are in now, the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute, or TBSI. It was opened uh, earlier this year. And Trinity College Dublin is, I think, known for its old buildings, particularly the magnificent buildings in Front Square and the old library, which we'll be in later today. These are the buildings that draw the tourists. But the research action happens in the many new buildings put up in the last few decades. And this mix of the old and the new is very much a feature of Trinity. We often, uh, in our work, talk about creating incubators. These are buildings where people come and do novel ideas. But Trinity is a university that is itself an incubator. This is very much a feature of the dynamic space where our students and staff exist and feel supported by tradition, but also open to the new. In fact, the juxtaposition of the old and the new is best showcased in our two main visitor attractions. The first is the Book of Kells, which dates back to the 9th century and is one of the world's oldest and most beautiful books. And the second is the Science Gallery, which opened in 2008 as a place where art and science collide. In 2011, we received a gift from Google to launch Global Science Gallery Network, a network of eight science galleries, which we are developing in partnership with leading universities in urban centers worldwide. And just yesterday, I returned from Bangalore, where we are in the advanced stages of opening a science gallery supported by the Karnataka state government. Now, I hope that in the next uh, two days, at some point, you'll get the chance to visit both the Science Gallery and the Book of Kells. Universities, as key players in innovation ecosystems, must create the right space and conditions for groundbreaking research to happen. That's what goes on in this building. But they must also build innovation pathways to connect with industry and bring that research out for the benefit of society. So to the university's age-old mission, core mission in education and research is added a new dimension, the mission to innovate and open opportunities for entrepreneurship. But how can universities ensure that their research is cutting edge, groundbreaking and compelling enough to attract industry partners? And my view on this is that so long as you're creating knowledge at a faster rate and a higher level than your competitors, then you're opening up opportunities for innovation. Ultimately, with the potential of creating jobs and wealth and improving society. And this knowledge can come in all forms. Of course, it can be technological, but it also can be cultural, creative knowledge. And those kinds of entrepreneurship are also important. And what matters is that this research is world class and competitive. You can't do it behind national borders. Maybe there was a time when this was useful. You could develop something in Ireland. Ireland used to have shoe factories in every town in the country. These shoe factories disappeared overnight when uh, the country was opened to global competition. 
and it's a bit the same with research. Trinity has uh, 24 schools, ranging from business, drama and law, to chemistry, engineering and medicine. And some of the most exciting research happens at the interfaces between these disciplines. So it's the university's policy to encourage schools and departments to collaborate and offer joint programs. Through clustering expertise into multidisciplinary teams, Trinity has built up a portfolio of thematic research areas for which we are recognized worldwide, such as next generation medical devices, neuroscience, digital humanities, immunology and infection, telecommunications, and aging. And the funding of all of these would have a component of uh, competitive research funding, university core budget, and philanthropy. So just as uh, much of the exciting research happens at the interface between disciplines, so also does it happen at the interface between different mindsets, often to be found in different countries and in different types of institutions. Universities need to collaborate and refresh their ideas uh, through multiple different approaches. And as we, many of us university presidents travel around the world and we think, gosh, they're doing this in Asia or they're doing that in North America. But one of the things that Europe's strengths and that you don't see so commonly in other places is these collaborative networks. Encouraged through the framework programs, no doubt, but they're a strong asset for Europe's research. Because higher education today is increasingly uh, a globally traded and borderless activity. People and research projects no longer belong exclusively to one university or institution. <coughs> Staff, students and research switch between countries and institutions, going to where the money is and where the expertise is. And the EIT grew out of the full desire to make use of these opportunities. And it is up to universities, universities like mine, like Trinity College, to seize the initiative. I'll just finish, I'll say a little bit about Trinity. We have 16,800 students, undergraduates and postgraduates. About a quarter of our students are international, that is from outside Ireland. And about half of our 800 faculty are from outside Ireland. And Trinity will continue with this uh, globalization strategy. It will happen inevitably. And it will improve internationalization and research collaborations. We believe uh, we're moving in the right direction. You can't hear a speech from a university president without mentioning the rankings, particularly if you're moving up. So uh, we've moved up to, ni to ninth place in Europe in the recent Leiden rankings, which uh, these Leiden rankings are, um, of course, use citation matrices and so on, not the reputation surveys of the other rankings. But I think in, that, uh, in those rankings, because uh, the data uh, is based on um, independent, if you like, data, it's very good that we've moved up in them to ninth place. The products and services arising from our global education and research are internationally competitive and aimed at a world market. In the past five years in Trinity, over 60 commercial licenses have been granted and 32 new campus companies founded to commercialize intellectual property. Some of our spin-outs have achieved great global success. I'm thinking of companies like Havoc, founded in 1988 to commercialize research into physics simulation software for computer games and films, and a decade later sold to Intel for $110 million. More than 20% of all of Ireland's spin-out companies come from Trinity College. And this figure alone shows how vital universities can be when it comes to improving the growth and competitiveness of the cities, regions, and countries where they are situated. This is to benefit not only the university but the whole of Dublin and indeed the country. And I think the EIT was born out of such an awareness. The EIT formalizes on a much larger continental scale what universities like Trinity are hoping to achieve in their regions and countries. In the EIT, we talk about the knowledge triangle. Ideally, Europe will have a, a myriad of knowledge triangles assembling into a knowledge pyramid. The more knowledge triangles we have, and the better they can work in partnership and synergy, the sooner we will move out of austerity into economic gain. I'll finish with a quote from an Irish poet, many of you will know, William Butler Yeats. He once remarked that education is not about the filling of a pail or a bucket, 
It's about the lighting of a fire. And I like this quote. It reminds us that education is, in the best sense, not something safe or contained. It reminds us that the spark that ignites the EIT is education. Great research, great products, great entrepreneurs, all these start with great students. And it's the job of universities to light the fire in students and send them out into the world to spread the flame. Let's remember, over the next two days, as we look at our knowledge triangles working in synergy, that it all starts with the fledgling undergraduate coming to a university in Freshers' Week. With that, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, the first of our opening addresses. It will be given by uh, Sean Sherlock. Uh, Sean Sherlock is the Minister of State for Research and Innovation, and he's an Irish Labour Party politician. He has uh, been a TD, or Member of the Parliament, for Cork East since May 2007. I uh, know Sean for quite some, uh, some time, but I looked him up on Wikipedia this morning for the first time ever. <laughs> And uh, I found out that he's an economist. <laughs> but I won't hold that too much against him. <laughs> an economist and, and uh, studied ec economics and politics in uh, University College Galway, NUI Galway. Uh, and worked, in fact, in the uh, office of uh, Princeas de Rossa MEP in the European Parliament. It's a great pleasure to introduce him. And I'll hand over now the uh, podium to Sean Sherlock. Thank you very much. You should all look up Paddy Pendergast on uh, Wikipedia and see what you might find. <laughs> what, you, what they won't tell you is that he's an old art, the Bala Man, which is a, a, a hurling club in Wexford, which is a famous uh, hurling club, and it's a great hurling county. And he's of that, as we'd say in Ireland, he's of that stock, and good stock as well, I might add. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Provost, uh, Paddy Prendergast and Madame Carvalho, uh, Xavier and Alexander, uh, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, um, I, I'm delighted to welcome you to Dublin to uh, address you at the opening of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology Conference uh, on fostering innovation and strengthening synergies uh, within the European Union. Uh, can I say on a personal note, uh, that I'm particularly delighted that we have Madame Carvalho here with us uh, because I believe she's a very strong advocate for the EIT concept uh, and I have gotten to know Madame Carvalho uh, over the lifetime of the Irish presidency and I know that she is extremely committed to this agenda uh, and I know that she is extremely committed with the European parliamentarians to try to ensure that under Horizon 2020 that we reach a conclusion uh, which the, the three institutions, the Council, the Commission and uh, the European Parliament uh, can reach that conclusion for uh, the research community uh, and industry uh, throughout uh, Europe uh, as, as soon as we possibly can and I'm delighted that she is uh, with us here today. Um, this conference provides a wonderful opportunity for the EIT and the KICS to not alone showcase their achievements, but also for all of us to reflect on the potential impact of EIT and KIC activities on the innovation capacity of the European Union. It is fitting that the conference is being held here in the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute, uh, which is one of Ireland's flagship centres of for research and, and innovation. And I think Paddy um, has, has referred to uh, the importance of this institute uh, earlier. Its strategic goal is to create an environment which promotes convergence, um, interdisciplinarity, and thematic strength in preclinical biomedical sciences, and one where innovation can flourish, very much aligned with the fundamental mission of EIT. I was particularly taken by the theme running through the plenary sessions today, achieving and measuring impact. This is a focus uh, that must be at the center of all our efforts as we 
develop new mechanisms, funding programs, and other supports to advance Europe's capacity for and capabilities in research and innovation. In times of restricted financial resources, we must make uh, even greater efforts to ensure that available resources are achieving maximum impact and benefit for Europe and its citizens. Ireland's overarching priority during our presidency of the Council uh, is to seek ways of supporting sustainable jobs and growth in Europe and of restoring uh, economic stability and competitiveness to the European economy. An enduring focus on education, research and innovation would provide the fundamental bedrock for the European economy of the future. And these have therefore been placed at the centre of the Europe 2020 strategy to promote smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. I don't need to convince any of you here today of the importance of this agenda. Europe is experiencing one of its most uh, economically challenging periods. To meet these challenges, we must ensure that our education systems are producing highly skilled graduates that have the breadth, the depth and range of skills and knowledge appropriate to a 21st century economy and society. We must promote entrepreneurial qualities and we need to provide the right environment so that high quality research development and innovation can flourish and bear fruit. And above all, we must ensure that academia and researchers engage proactively with the enterprise community. EIT and its unique approach to innovation, with its focus clearly on the integration of the knowledge triangle, presents a powerful potential to deliver a real step change in the EU innovation landscape. Close cooperation between the three parts of the Knowledge Triangle has benefits for all. It enhances the relevance and attractiveness of higher education programmes. It provides business with the skilled people that it needs to access uh, to cutting-edge research. And it provides graduates with assurances on the relevance and marketability of their skills. Moreover, the bringing together of these key actors in the innovation chain, each bringing their own perspective and expertise to the table, provides a truly holistic approach to innovation and provides the platform for achieving real impact. It creates an environment where new ways of approaching and solving modern dilemmas can flourish. Despite its relative youth, uh, EIT has already proven itself as a highly successful model uh, for fostering innovation. The three kicks are engaging in a wide range of activities that are resulting in real outputs, be it entrepreneurially uh, focused graduates, new products or services, new companies, enhanced processes uh, are just some of those. The impact of kick activities will continue to grow as the EIT matures. KICs further develop their working methods and best practice approaches are disseminated then across the European Union. I know you will consider important issues tomorrow in relation to EIT's role within the broader EU innovation landscape, synergies with other instruments and initiatives and EIT's engagement with stakeholders and regions. These will all be important features as EIT and KICS continue to grow and develop. From Ireland's perspective, our programme for government emphasises the role of knowledge and innovation as driving forces of economic productivity. A central part of the government's plan for jobs and growth is to ensure that research is better targeted at turning the good ideas of scientists into products and jobs. As a government and as a system collectively, we are seeking to embed many of the traits and underpinning principles of the EIT approach in our national research and innovation system. Our research capabilities have been dramatically enhanced over the past decade and as a country we have increased our international rankings in terms of the quality of that research. The focus now 
is on building critical mass across the system and ensuring real impact, a topic uh, you will be examining today uh, in detail in relation uh, to EIT. We are undertaking a major process of reform in our higher education system, which will see the development of regional clusters of institutions, which will act as beacons for innovation in their region. We have recently completed a major research prioritization process, which recommended priority areas for future state research investments based on the current expertise in our higher education institutions and on enterprise needs and opportunities. The fundamental pillars of this process were delivering critical mass and ensuring impact. A robust monitoring process then is now, under, is, is now being put in place for all state investments in research. And we are lucky in Ireland that we already have a strong foundation of higher education and business working together. This is something we are continually uh, seeking to enhance and grow. Uh, and is now a central feature of national funding programmes. Ireland recently announced major funding support for world-class researchers in seven research centres. These centres will collaborate with a large range of enterprise partners spanning large multinationals and SMEs. The underlying philosophy is the forging of deep and lasting alliances between industry and our research community, and this represents Ireland's drive to better integrate the three sides of that uh, knowledge triangle uh, that Paddy has referred to earlier. To conclude, I am looking forward to watching EIT's continued development over the coming years, to the establishment of new kicks and the further embedding of current activities and the expansion of the EIT philosophy and working methods across the European Union. As you will all be aware, Proposals for the future development of EIT are currently under consideration in Brussels. The Irish Presidency is working hard in cooperation with the European Parliament and the European Commission to finalise the strategic innovation agenda for EIT uh, over the next seven-year period as part of the broader package of Horizon 2020 proposals. And I want to thank again the Parliament and the Commission for their uh, strident efforts uh, in this regard. This package of measures has the potential to make a real difference to Europe's competitiveness and innovation policy. The Irish Presidency will continue the Horizon 2020 negotiations against the background of a number of key principles, including the paramount principle of excellence in research and innovation activities, the concept of widening participation in a broader sense, including fostering participation across member states and regions, and the overall importance of synergies between Horizon 2020 with other EU programmes. I want to uh, thank in advance all the speakers for their uh, agreement to participate and provide us with their uh, wonderful uh, insights and their expert insights. I would also like to congratulate the governing board of uh, the EIT, its chairman, Alexander, and director, Jose Manuel, uh, for the work that they are doing. Uh, and of course, our host and governing board member, uh, Paddy Prendergast. Finally, I want to uh, thank the staff of the EIT for organizing the conference. Um, I know it takes an enormous amount of work. Um, your work is appreciated. Um, for any of you who are visiting Dublin for the first time, and if you have um, a day or two to spare, uh, if I'm being slightly parochial, uh, you know, I could recommend the, the fair county of Cork uh, for a visit as well <laughs> while you're in these shores. Um, the confines of Trinity College are wonderful. Uh, I should, if, again, if I'm being parochial, state that uh, a famous Irish patriot uh, called Thomas Davis, who was uh, uh, a graduate of this esteemed institution, was born in my hometown of Mallow, and he was a great uh, advocate for uh, the power of education. And his catchphrase, which is often used uh, by people, uh, is educate that you may be free. So with that, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you here. 
I uh, want to thank everybody sincerely for the amount of work that they've done in putting this conference together. Uh, and I, it, it is very important in terms of the European Union agenda from an educational, economic, societal, uh, research point of view. Uh, and we're truly delighted uh, to have you here uh, in Dublin. Gurumila Mahagat. Thank you very much, Sean. Good to get a plug in for Cork, all right, no doubt. Um, my pleasure now is to introduce uh, the next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Xavier Pratt Monet, Deputy uh, Director General uh, for DG AAC, uh, that is Education and Culture, in the European Commission. Xavier. <coughs> Uh, dear Provost, uh, Minister Shellock, Mrs. Dagrasa Carvalho, Alex, ladies and gentlemen, this was a very brief introduction, as you have seen, and that is because I should start with uh, uh, an apology, uh, because today it is uh, Mrs. Andula Vasiliou who should be here. Mrs. Vasiliou, as a commissioner, ever since two and a half years ago, the discussion started within the commission for the next seven-year budget, made a real extraordinary effort, I believe, in showing, at the one hand, that there was proof of concept in the EIT, and the EIT had a mission in itself, but also that that mission was just part of a much bigger challenge, which is the challenge of Horizon 2020. And even beyond that, the EIT had something real to say about Europe's future through innovation. Uh, so uh, I should apologize for her not being here. The consequence of that is that I have the privilege of saying just a few words to you today. And I should start by a word of thanks to the Trinity uh, College Dublin and its 44th province, uh, not just because uh, of courtesy, not just because any institution, any individual actually, should consider it as a privilege to be hosted by a, a place that has given to the world people like Swift, Wilde, uh, uh, and uh, um, Beckett, uh, but also for something much more important. If we are here today, it's also to underline that at the end of the day, the EIT is about education and about people. And this is, in fact, the distinctive feature of the IT, because if the IT were to be just another instrument within Horizon 2020, then we don't really need so many instruments. But beyond that, I think that the really critical lesson we get from Trinity College is that we want institutions that prepare people for excellence, give them an excellent education through a focus on research and innovation. And this is what the EIT and I hope, the EIT, I hope, and certainly Trinity is. If I take the last words of Paddy Provost in his uh, inaugural address, what he said is that he wanted the Trinity to be a university that gets public funding because, and I would say only because, it serves the public good, and that it wants it to be a world-class institution playing in the world for Ireland. Now, if I just change Ireland for Europe, I think that that is a fantastic statement as to what the EIT should be, at least from the point of view of the Commission. So indeed, thanks a lot to Trinity and to Paddy Prendergast. He is um, multitasking at the, as a member of the board, but there's a long experience of uh, Trinity College Provost multitasking. The first Provost actually was multitasking as Archbishop of Dublin. I, I'm not sure Paddy is looking to be that, but certainly we welcome very much uh, that he has accepted to be a member of the board. So we are here today uh, to discuss uh, about uh, fostering innovation and strengthening synergies within Europe. This is easier said than done. This is difficult at all times. It is not just difficult, it is necessary in times of crisis. Because it is in these times of crisis that it is particularly difficult to make decisions about public investment, to decide where, public, where scarce public funds should go, and where the efforts of European citizens should go. But certainly, the EIT is the expression of the fact that if we want to get uh, European economies back on track, what we need to do is to provide young and talented people with opportunities here in Europe. Uh, so this is, this is indeed the initial proposition for the EIT. And at EU level, we're trying to do just that by sending a clear signal that even in times of necessary fiscal discipline, even in times of budget constraints, there has to be a priority on innovation and on investing in people. So as you know, in an overall EU budget proposal from the Commission that is essentially flat, precisely for reasons of fiscal discipline, 
the Commission in its proposal has clearly identified two areas, two areas that should grow and that should grow significantly. Actually, that should grow much more than any other aspect and chapter of the European budget, and that is innovation, Horizon 2020, and education. This is what the Commission proposed, and we're happy to see that although the European Council, uh, in its own decision, has significantly lowered the overall budget, it has also made a clear statement that innovation and education should be preserved in the future budget. So we don't know the figures that will be at hand, the amount that will be available, but we do know that the EAT will have a clear role and a strong responsibility in the task of innovation. It will be part of Horizon 2020, the European Union's framework for research and innovation. This is very important to bear in mind. The EAT will be part of Horizon 2020, but it will not be just any part. It will not be just another program of Horizon 2020. The EAT has a lot to offer and will contribute to the objectives on Horizon, of Horizon 2020 in essentially three main ways. First, through its knowledge triangle approach, as has been mentioned before, the EAT brings a full-fledged education dimension to Horizon 2020. It is the only instrument of Horizon 2020 that brings that dimension directly. And indeed, if we want to be truly innovative, we have to set out stakes uh, on talented people. Secondly, the EAT will contribute through their kicks and their thematic areas, and thus it will contribute to the societal challenges of Horizon 2020. There is a great potential for synergies and complementarity between the kicks and the other instruments of the EU budget, and this has been indeed perhaps the most, the strongest focus, the strongest effort by the Commission in drafting the strategic innovation agenda with the governing board of DIT to show indeed not just the distinctiveness of DIT, not just the added value it brings, but also the strength of the links with the societal challenges of Horizon 2020. Um, and indeed, one of the societal challenges that we certainly should consider, and this is why we're so happy that this is clearly in today's and tomorrow's program, is that the EIT should, of course, focus on excellence, but it should be a European instrument. Therefore, the regional dimension, the extension of the benefits of the EIT and the kicks across Europe are a critical element for the future and one that we will be discussing today. And last but not least, of course, the EIT has also a unique experience to offer in doing things differently and from other more traditional approaches. Through the EIT, uh, through the kick, sorry, the EIT has created new ways of delivering. The focus on results and the bottom-up approach mean that kicks are real drivers of innovation. And in this too, we hope to take the example of, if I understand correctly, Patty Pendergrass's message that the, the key is not to have just new institutions, but to make sure that all institutions can also behave like young ones and can behave in an innovative way. And this is not just a very positive message for Trinity. I think it is perhaps a paradigm of what Europe should be doing. We are an old continent. We have venerable institutions. The, the point is not to change them. It's to make sure, not to replace them with new ones. It's to make sure that these institutions meet the challenges of the next century. And this is, at the end of the day, the challenge and the offer of the EAT. We have here today the CEOs and many other members of the existing kick, so I will not draw on uh, the content and what, of what they do. Just, just, just let me just underline how impressive the manner is in which the kicks are driving innovation. In a very, very short period of time, indeed, by any institutional standard, the kicks have created many new opportunities for talented people. They have educated and trained them in new courses and programs. They have helped them follow their entrepreneurial dreams and have fought the, the new businesses, uh, that brought new businesses to fruition. This, as I said, in an extremely short period of time. The key challenge, the key objective uh, now, is to present those features that allow the EIT to follow this approach, flexibility, autonomy, and the long-term perspective. And this is precisely what we have tried to do at the European Commission, what we have put forward in, its, in our proposals for the EIT future. A way to preserve flexibility, autonomy, and long-term perspective while contributing to the broader objectives of Horizon 2020. So we believe that the EIT and the KICS concept has shown its value, and it is time now 
to scale up their impact. After the initial years in which essentially the EAT was an experiment, uh, they now enter a new phase where we have the proof of concept and we would like to see the benefits expand further across Europe. So for the next period, 2014-2020, we have proposed to consolidate further and further develop the existing three kicks, to set up six new kicks in areas of important economic and societal challenges, and to multiply the impact of the EIT by strengthening outreach and dissemination activities and by engaging widely with talented people. We don't know uh, what would be the final decision on the future kicks on the budget of the EIT. We do think that there is merit for a stronger bigger EIT. And I would like to conclude with two words of encouragement to Council and Parliament and to the Presidency. I know, sir, that, that uh, the Irish Presidency has many bigger cuts to fry. Uh, in a trillion euro budget of the EU, three billion for the EIT doesn't perhaps look like much, but, but I know, sir, that the Irish Presidency with its skill will not be fooled by the size of the EIT today. If you think of the things that have succeeded in Europe, there's many things that started extremely small and today are a symbol of what Europe can do with its citizens. Look at the Erasmus program. 25 years ago when it started, with I think 50 people moving around Europe, nobody would have thought what Erasmus would be. If today you ask anybody in Europe, please tell me quickly something good that Europe has done for its citizens, I think Erasmus comes to mind. The challenge is to be sure that the presidency, the Irish presidency, will be the one that will be able to claim that it's been the one who has understood the potential of the EIT. And to Mrs. Graça Carvalho, I, I, I think, Madam, your presence in the negotiations of the EIT have been extremely reassuring for the Commission, and I know I speak for Mrs. Vasilio, for a very simple reason, because from the beginning of your action on the EIT in Holland 2020, you have understood the strategic value of the EIT, both in what it has that is specific and what it has that is common to the objectives of Horizon 2020. And we are sure and we are ready, of course, to contribute modestly in the Commission now to make sure that we will end before the end of this year, actually as soon as possible, with a clear message that the EIT and Horizon 2020 are really the future of Europe citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, I think I don't need to uh, say much more in introducing uh, Maria de Gracia Carvalho, uh, so I'll do so now and ask her to take the podium. She is chairwoman of the Friends of the EIT MEP Network in the European Parliament. Good morning, uh, Minister, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honour for me to have been invited to give you this opening address at today's meeting. And I would like to congratulate the EIT, its governing board, and the Trinity College Dublin for this successful event. Uh, as member of the European Parliament, as it was said, I'm currently responsible for the report on the specific program implementing Horizon 2020. However, I have been directly involved in the EIT from the outset. Indeed, I was part of the team that planned the initial idea uh, and began its implementation when I worked for five years in the European Commission as part of the group of advisors reporting directly to President Barroso. Since I became uh, an MEP, where I now sit in the ITRE and in the Budget Committee, I have the honor of being asked to be the co-chair of the Parliament's group of friends of EIT, a group that was created in March 2011. In this capacity, I can assure you that there is a real and active support for the EIT in the European Parliament. As for the main theme of today's meeting, the discussion of the present and future state of the EIT, this is particularly timely given that we are currently finalizing the six reports for Horizon 2020, uh, of which two reports have direct relevance to the EIT. In this respect, the rapporteurs from the Parliament are negotiating the final details of Horizon 2020 with the Council, with the Irish Presidency and the Commission. All the three institutions are committed to finishing the negotiations during the Irish Presidency. 
in order to allow for the proper implementation of Horizon 2020 at January 2014. In this respect, I would like to thank the Irish Presidency and uh, the personal engagement of Mi uh, Minister Sean Sherlock. Thank you very much for your engagement. You have shared yourself lengthy negotiations uh, to, to make sure that we will finish in time and that our researchers and uh, companies will, have, will not have a gap between uh, the seven framework program and the present EIT and Horizon 2020. So I think we all are very uh, knowledge, uh, acknowledged to you for your personal effort to make sure that everything will finish in time. Again, also, I would like to thank the Commission um, for all engaging all this negotiation um, that has been a very lengthy procedure and we hope that we'll finish uh, before the end of the Irish Presidency so that the uh, European Commission has the time to prepare all the necessary calls for proposal and that we can continue without any um, gaps between the two programs, as I have said. Against this background, I hope that today's discussion will allow the different stakeholders to gain a better impression of the progress that has uh, so far been made and to contribute with their own input as we approach the final uh, negotiations of the program. My colleague, Mr. Lambert van Nistelrooy, uh, that is the EPP rapporteur of one of the EIT reports, uh, he's here and is, is going to talk just after uh, this, uh, in, the, in the first session on, um, after us. Uh, and I'm sure that he will give you more details about the current state of play with regard to the EIT itself, the EIT negotiations. As for my own contributions, I should like to concentrate on the general features of Horizon 2020 that, of course, include the EIT. Ladies and gentlemen, after five years of fruitful growth, the EIT is, a, is in a critical moment. Like a flower, the EIT will either blossom or either uh, um, fade away, depending on whether or not the conditions are right for its growth. What then can we do to make sure that the EIT blossoms? As I understand, this can be done by making the best possible choice in terms of the future kicks, actively fostering stability in rules, procedures, whilst ensuring that the ongoing simplification process is maintained, and finally, by supporting an appropriate budget for the EIT as proposed by the European Commission. Indeed, I hope that the results of the negotiation concerning the overall European budget for the period 2014-2020 will end satisfactory and desirable before the end of May. As I told you, the negotiations of Horizon 2020 are going very well. We are prepared to finishing very soon. But as you understand, we cannot finish without having the overall figure for Horizon 2020. And this depends on the budget negotiations. That is a, a parallel process that is, is going on also between uh, Parliament, uh, Irish Presidency, and the Commission, but at the level of Ministers of Finance and Heads of Governments. So uh, we have uh, news that uh, this process is a very complex and uh, we may have delays and this is something that we are very worried in the Horizon 2020 because without having the figure for Horizon 2020 we cannot close the dossier. And this is true for all other programs, from the regional funds to agriculture to Galileo. To, and uh, uh, it's something very worried for uh, the situation uh, for the European researchers, SMEs, and agriculture. So we hope that uh, these negotiations will end in time and satisfactorily that we can finish Horizon 2020. And this will mean an adequate budget for Horizon 2020. We have been uh, given the figure of 70.2 billion by the Commission based on the conclusions 
uh, of the council co uh, in, in February is a figure that we are not happy, so we hope that our negotiators in the European Parliament still can uh, increase this figure for uh, um, the Horizon 2020, so that we can give to the EIT and to the other parts of Horizon 2020 the ambitions that they, the EIT deserves and uh, Europe requires. However, Horizon 2020 and the EIT are much more than funding programs. Both will be fundamental instruments in structuring research and innovation and education in Europe over the years to come. Generally speaking, both should be as simple as possible, effectively and adequately funded, include a comprehensive approach to the passage from research to market, and be designed in such a way as to overcome fragmentation and to encourage collaboration across Europe and beyond. Actually, Horizon 2020 and EIT are very, a very important part of the European strategy for research and innovation, are not funding, only funding mechanisms. It's the overall, are probably the most important part of the overall research, innovation and education European strategy. More particular, uh, of uh, many different aspects of Horizon 2020, uh, four aspects in particular stand out. There are first, simplification, secondly, a comprehensive approach to the, the whole cycle of innovation, thirdly, the widening of participation, and finally, the questions of synergies with other funds. These four principles that are very keen to the Parliament, and there have been a lot of amendments for the Parliament in these four principles, are common to Horizon 2020 and, of course, to the EIT. However, EIT is a unique program and it combines education with research and innovation. It is designed in such a way as to have a direct impact on employment and growth through a culture of entrepreneurship, creation of new talents and um, of startups. To begin with simplification. Simplification is something of a crusade with me. As a result, it is with a sense of mission accomplished that I note that the European Commission proposed for Horizon 2020 includes the greatest part of the many recommendations that I have been able to make when I act as a rapporteur for the simplification report. Indeed, Horizon 2020 should be as simple as well structured as possible. There is no necessary conflicts in this respect between simplification of the operating rules and the rigor in which programs are managed. Quite the opposite, it is often the case. Efficiencies are adversely affected by excessive complexity in the allocation of funds. Secondly, with regard to the uh, whole cycle of innovation, one of the main problems that Europe faces is not much lack of quality of, sci uh, of uh, scientific excellence. It is more the weakness of the mechanisms that allow for transfer of knowledge and innovation to the real economy. The ability to innovate, but also to see innovation through the viable market solutions, it is of central importance. Unfortunately, in recent years, industry involvement in European science and innovation programs has tended to fall off. Horizon 2020 and EIT aims to counter-react this tendency, notably by encouraging active engagement of small and medium enterprises and European companies. In these respects, Horizon 2020 and the EIT aims to smooth what is often long and expensive paths from fundamental research to commercial exploitation. The whole innovation cycle should be covered as this will lead to a greater participation on the part of European enterprise with a special emphasis to industry. Thirdly, Horizon 2020 places a considerable emphasis on widening participation. The widening of participation conceived 
of in such a way as to encourage the involvement of strong units of embryonic excellence, such as small research groups, small university departments, and highly innovative startups. This can be achieved, achieved by fostering great transparency through simplification of rules and through the development of instruments that will enable SMEs and smaller organizations to play a much more active role in the European research and innovation environment. As an example in this respect is the twinning scheme, uh, a principle that should also apply uh, to the EIT. At the same time, the heightening of the excellence should remain the central to Horizon 2020 in the EIT, something that suppose that excellence is defined independently of any geographical or other precondition. Finally, let me say a few words about the synergies with other funds. Achieving at once scientific excellence, industrial competitiveness, whilst meeting our societal challenge is beyond the resources of a single program. At the same time, Europe's ambitions to cover the whole cycle of innovation will inevitably require a multi-fund approach. For this reason, Horizon 2020 should be articulated with and complemented by other parallel sources of European, national and regional funds. In particular, European uh, structural funds could be deployed both upstream and downstream for Horizon 2020 to enhance the capacity building and to facilitate the passage from concept to market. The notion that the EIT, through the kicks, should engage with the regions of Europe whilst making use of a variety of EU funds is in line with the general principle of encouraging synergies with the structural funds. It only remains for me to wish you very fruitful discussions as all these topics will be developed during these two days. Your discussions will be of considerable use in helping us to define the final details of Horizon 2020 and the EIT. Thank you very much and um, wish you a very successful conference and a good stay in Dublin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Cavallo, for that. Uh, very comprehensive uh, analysis of the situation in, uh, in Europe. I now introduce the next speaker, and I understand uh, this session will move seamlessly into the next one, um, because that's being chaired by this speaker as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, Alexander von Gabain, who is the chairman of the EIT Governing Board. Alexander. Queen is going forward, okay. <coughs> dear Minister, dear members of the European Parliament, dear colleagues uh, from the KICS and from the EIT, from the management crew as well, from the governing board, I like to thank you that you really all came today to try one more time to summarize what are our efforts to make the EIT in the kicks becoming a European success story. There's a lot of talking about what is innovation, and there's a lot of disturbances out there, what is innovation. And the key point is, it's not discovery, it's not invention, it's not translation. Innovation, uh, following the proposition of the Austrian Nobel Prize laureate Schumpeter, is really bringing an idea or a concept back to the people, which then really is changing the societal reality. And this is what we really try to foster in building up this new initiative of the EIT. Europe is still a powerhouse of excellent schools. And in that context, Patrick, I'd like to thank you to have the privilege that you are hosting us today at this famous Trinidad College. Still 40% of all Nobel Prizes are harvested by European research institutions. We have powerhouses like universities which are in the top class of the world or famous institutes like the Institut Pasteur, Max Planck, Karolinska Institute, 
and famous technical universities. We have fantastic companies. We have small and medium-sized enterprises. We have even the seat of venture capital in Europe. Still, we all know we are not delivering in the expectation of what we really should in a global competition. So just have a look to see the reality and not to be discouraged. Take the field of biotech. I think since biotech has been implemented about 30, 35 years ago, there were two key uh, discoveries. The monoclonal antibody invented in Cambridge by Caesar Milstein and Köhler, and the DNA or the recombinant DNA technology by Stanley Cohen and Herb Boyer. Uh, the recombinant DNA story was <coughs> translated in a fantastic US biotech industry and I think the rector, and I can say this here in Ireland, of the Cambridge University said to uh, Milstein and Köhler, he doesn't think it's worthwhile to get a patent fight on the monoclonal antibody, also these are the two columns of modern biotechnology. I don't like to run you through all these numbers. What it's basically saying is we are performing nicely, but subcritical and not in the order of magnitude what Europe would deserve to earn out of its enormous power it would have in innovation if all players would come together. Maybe the smoking gun is really that the number of new companies set up is relatively minute in Europe. Only 2% of all companies which are in the innovative sector in Europe, which you can see on this chart, have been set up in the last uh, 25 years while in the United States this is about every fifth company is a new company. And I think just makes a control, you have a hard time to find a Google, to find a Genentech and others which are, so to say, coming at your hand if you try to compare the old and the new continent. So what we need are, and this is a childhood photo of Bill Gates, we need to breed more this brand of people. I mean, people who are willing to take their knowledge and to carry it out. And we have to get all players together. We have to, so to say, get the professors on our side, not discourage their students, rather concluding their PhD thesis to go out and setting up a company and maybe out of a garage. So as you heard in this uh, already uh, fantastic speeches this morning, what we are really trying to set up at CEIT is to integrate the knowledge triangle, to get together research, technology, higher education and industry and we place into the center the entrepreneur. So the people who take initiative, the people who do it for the fun of changing something, taking the risk. And this is even to be said about the three CSO sitting in front of me and building up the first kicks and also our director. They're doing everything for the first time. I think it's the first time that we are building kicks. They never have been existing before and we are doing mistakes and we are learning from them. So what is the game change what we are addressing to. I think ownership, accountability, success, risk, but also failure. And I think this is another European disease. Failing is something which is a part of innovation and we should accept this. I think also to overcome the silo mentality. So I think it's not good that a good idea born here in Dublin uh, should not carry it over right away to Paris or to Vienna or to another city, let's say, if this is a smart way of running a city. We also need ecosystems that people casually meet each other. And this has to be physically, because a typical CFO, chief financial officer, has no idea how a scientist is functioning. And a scientist has to learn to understand that I think you need also smart risk investment into new ideas and that you need all the players in this camp. So we need to kind of to catalyze these ecosystems. Uh, this is just a chart from given to a friend of mine who is in venture industry and I think in any build up of innovative entrepreneurial activities, at the end of the day, the seed is important and that is what the EIT is focusing on. The EIT is using the taxpayers' monies in the critical stage to build the ecosystems that create innovation. So, in concrete, it's from the idea to the products, I think it's from the lab to the market, and from the student to the entrepreneur. And I think, how do we practice this in reality? You know, it is interesting, even this is important, to communicate. So you have many of the players in business, education, and of course uh, also in science and research and technology split all over Europe. And I think there are tendency, uh, which clearly should be stated, to get at least this triangle together at certain campuses. But rarely 
you put into the center, uh, really the, in the center of the triangle, the entrepreneurship and the ownership concept. And this is very pivotal. And even more really, you really get this uh, groups of people in different cities and countries really becoming interconnected. And this is exactly what is the principle of the KICS, that they are interconnected ecosystems in several hubs, in each of the hubs, in so-called co-location center, getting all the players together, but also to get them trans-European interconnected. So we have established the first three KICS, or I should better say they have established themselves, by the virtue of good management, and they are up and running, and we are learning from them, and we have many, many hubs now in Europe, not only hubs which are major focus points, we have also regional centers that participate in the three first existing kicks. And the track record, what has been achieved in only two and a half to three years, is really visible. We have 17 innovation hotspots, more than 350 partners are respectively integrated in those three kicks. And out of the seed money of about 300 million, which has been given to us, I think they have been, so to say, boostering up that seed money to about 1.1 billion euros, which is a great leverage. And about 1,000 students in an interdisciplinary fashion, including business and also entrepreneurship, have been educated. And I think I don't go through all this. You find those in the home pages. Let me just, at the end of my introduction also to today's session, making some remarks. Innovation is often awfully complex, and since this is my own field, which comes back from the pharma and biotech industry, I guess one single pharma product, let's say a new vaccine, always takes or never takes less than 10 years. A huge cycle, and you can see there are many stages where you can fail, and we fail in many of the stages. So you have to integrate all, even all that money you have invested and never coming to the end of your destination, and you register product which can help humans, let's say, against an infectious diseases or cancer. The amount of investment is gigantic. There's never one product launched which helps people which cost less than roughly 200 to 300 million euros. So this needs coordination of time, investment, and risk assessment, and I think it needs more. It needs also to go to paradigm shifts. And as we all know, we are still fostered in the Renaissance idea that it's a single genius which is carrying forward innovation. And I think not only in the science arena, we have to learn, we form larger and larger clusters of people that work together. Clusters not only of one sort of experts, clusters where you have everybody. Advocates who can help you to make a seeding contract with a venture company, uh, people who are kind of light towers who have spent their life in innovation, like many of our board members, in telling a younger student how you best write a business plan. And only if you really get the people in the right mindset, and I have written down some of the bullet points, and I guess since this presentation will be put in the public domain, you can read it. So what, in the end of the day, it is all about, we need Partners, talents, networks, education, mindset change, novel concepts and platforms. We need entree, but also intrapreneurship. We need in the big corporation a new brand of people driving them forward. Private investment, very important, not only public money. It's important that European middle class is risking money on the future of their children and the next generation. And I think only then we get sustainability and we get products and services back to the people. And I think you can see on the left column that this is what we hope to give back to Europe in competitiveness, high quality jobs, solution of challenges, and at the end of the day, impact. I conclude in stating while all this is possible and we see we are on the right path, it also takes a huge challenge. And I think uh, it was uh, Peter Drucker, I think uh, the well-known manager who has been writing a lot about the theory of uh, management. And I think if you go into his books, what you basically can learn is that it is very important to have good management. And we need to foster good management at the EIT headquarters, at the kicks, but also at our young students to realize at some stage they really have beyond the entrepreneurship to move the thing forward or to accept management competence. 
However, management can never replace entrepreneurship, and this is the way I like to conclude. And I think uh, thank you for listening, and we can directly lead over to the panel.